administration, we will go ahead and move on to our, our next segment. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Knighty is going to demonstrate interspinous decompression spacers. Uh, let me just say a couple of words while we're transitioning over to that segment. So interspinous spacers have uh, good level one evidence. These are primarily used for spinal stenosis. Uh, some of the fusion spacers are used for spinal stenosis com combined with spondylolisthesis or a little bit of spinal instability. Uh, these have been studied, especially the Vertiflex Superion, that's now a product of Boston Scientific, uh, in my opinion, hit the FDA at exactly the wrong time. And so these were, uh, the trials go out all the way to five years. And so we have data at one year, we have data at two years, we have data at five years. If you look at the five-year data, and this is what I tell my patients, so the five-year data, and this is a, a paper published by uh, lead authors, good friend of ours, Pierce Nunley, says, <clears throat> in essence, the leg pain is 80% better, the back pain on the average, the mean back pain is 65% better, and this is at 60 months or five years. And so this is durable. This is one of the one-centimeter incision uh, that you can actually place this with a, with, under moderate sedation. Uh, most of mine I do on, with prone Mac with propofol. Uh, this is deep sedation, of course. You can do it with moderate sedation. Some people do this with general anesthesia. But this is the type of patient you're looking for is somebody that is uh, older with spinal stenosis, uh, more comorbidities that needs a l less invasive uh, approach than general anesthesia, somebody that uh, you want to add an additional protocol in there, a step, so you go from <clears throat> epidural injections to decompression fusion, no, you want to take a step, uh, epidural injections to interspinous decompression spacers to minimally invasive surgical decompression, then to decompression fusion, but fusion only if, if you have spinal instability. So this is kind of a different uh, approach to add something um, additional that doesn't preclude and the the product that uh, Dr. Naidu is going to feature this morning has tines that go out aside from a body that is anywhere from 8, 10, 12, 16 millimeters from top to bottom. The reason those tines are, uh, they're called cam lobes, the reason why those are thin is to be able to get around it to do decompression. So whenever this was placed, it was placed with the idea that you would go in with the totalis device, which is, this is lost to institutional memory, but some of us remember this, is the totalis device was a minimally invasive lumbar decompression device. And this was designed to go in with the ability to, to do a minimally invasive lumbar decompression or mild or a PILD around the device. It doesn't preclude you doing minimally invasive surgical decompression, right, Dr. Shonard? Get your uh, metrics tube or whatever you're using down there and go to town with your kerosene, uh, your back angle curette, your Woodson, your ball tip probe, <clears throat> to be able to get in and around and decompress around this. Um, and so this is an added step, provides good, durable, long-term relief, not, it's not for everybody. I tend to favor this in people to provide them relief of their spinal stenosis, ability to stand and walk. And we, we tell people, um, and Dr. Naidu, are you about ready in there? We tell people that for decompressions, we can help you stand, we can help you walk, we can't help your back pain primarily. But most of the time, and I, I, this is what we say, this is our mantra, but I just mentioned to you that at five years, we have 65% reduction in back pain. So there is something to interspinous decompression spacers, whether it's unloading the facet or the back of the disc, that does help back pain. All right, Doug, we are ready. Fantastic. Take it away. Great introduction. As Doug just mentioned, great five-year level data from Pierce Nunley and the group. And what has happened over the last several years is that IDE study was done primarily, almost entirely, by surgeons. And in, during commercialization since 2017, the majority of people doing this are interventional pain. And what we've seen from some of the registry data is the outcomes are just as good as what we've seen from the IDE study. 
Boston Scientific acquired Vertiflex in 2019, and now we are enrolling patients for the SCOPE study, which is basically mimicking the rigor of the IDE five-year data study. So looking forward to those results, seeing how it works, and we expect it to work just as well, but let's let the data tell us. So I'm going to go through the procedure. Um, if you've watched other SSF videos, you probably have seen me do this before. So I want to add you know, some nuance and some next level uh, additions as far as how I do this. So we have, a, we have a beautiful cadaver just based on the fluoro anatomy right here. And we have John working with me, my fluoro tech. So we're going we're gonna to jump right in. And we're going to presume that this patient has L3-4 stenosis. Uh, in other years, I've done L4-5, so I just thought I'd change it up, just choose a different level. Uh, obviously, we'd have the imaging to support that, that diagnosis. This is indicated on label for moderate spinal stenosis, and that could be of uh, the neuroframen, lateral recess, or the central canal. So to jump right in, um, in general, as you know, we had always reviewed the anatomy prior to starting, but what I do is I take a pointer and I start right at the very bottom tip of the L3 spinous process, and I put a dot right there. Okay, and then I go 1.5 centimeters down. Perfect. Oop, I got the pedal. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> you're good. And I just draw a dot right there. And then what I do is I draw a line. And the reason for that is if your incision is off midline at all, you're going to you're going to favor one, that one side or the other. And the issue is here is that you have the supraspinous ligament and the interspinous ligament, which is trying to veer you off to the left or the right. So if you can ensure that your incision is right down the middle the first time, it helps you balance out exactly what you want to see. So I draw my line there. Uh, I don't know if the camera has a view on the mark here, but I draw that line. And then a firm incision, 1.5 centimeters right down. Use electrocautery if you need um, for the pain physicians here. You know, just get a, get a sense by feeling into that interspinous groove, right? There's a tendency here to um, just use fluoro alone, but use all the senses that you have. And so here, I can feel the interspinous groove, beautiful. And then what I do is I just follow my finger right down, and I get my dilator one to be right in, in that groove. Now, one of the things you may notice here that I'm doing is I don't have the handle on. Uh, most people use the handle. It's a plastic topper on this. The reason I don't is the fidelity of my malleting is better um, with just the metal pin here. So the, the, most, the most important thing to do here is watch my hand. So I'll use my left hand. There's no fluoro. I'll mallet, 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 you know, advance a little bit. And I can feel with my left hand that I'm advancing a millimeter or two. Then I check because, again, the tendency is for this instrument, dilator one, to veer off to the right or left. So then I mallet, mallet, mallet. I go a little bit further. I'm getting a feel. I check. Perfect. And this is the back and forth. So if you can master this back and forth, this will ensure success. And one of the things, if you've done this procedure, is if you go in the wrong track right away, you're going to end up really, really kind of screwing yourself. So for the anesthesiologist, you know, as you know, if you, intubate, you want to intubate the first time. The second time you try to intubate, it's a total mess. Third time, it's a disaster. You're calling other people. So just like that sort of adage, you want to make sure you're perfect the very first time. So this is what it looks like. So we've got purchase, which means dilator one is standing up on its own. So John, if you can go to a lateral and park that image to the right, beautiful, reading my mind. I love floor text that can read my mind. On the side of the instrument, you can see the markings, the depth markings in millimeters. Um, so that helps us understand uh, how deep we are. <clears throat> And we'll get this lateral image here. Perfect. So you can see dilator one is in the interspinous space between the L3 and L4 spinous processes. Kind of hard to make out the posterior border of the spinous process, but John's going to play with his collimation and contrast and get that all figured out. So I'm going to advance dilator one to what's called the spinal laminar line. And what that is, it's the shadow of the lamina, which is that zigzag formation uh, on your screen to the right. And maybe Doug can point that out in the, in the room. So I'm going to continue to advance to that spinal laminar line. Shot there, if you don't mind, John. Thanks. Since I've got you. Perfect. Shot there. Beautiful. And I'm just going to go a little bit further. Perfect. And I can even keep going a little bit further. 
And what's cool is that dilator one is shaped with two curves on the top and bottom. And it, once it gets that purchase, it rides the spinous processes um, on its own. So basically, once you're in that groove, if the patient doesn't have a significant lateral spinal esthesis, meaning the spinous processes are offset, if they're in line, dilator one will just follow right through. So that's good on depth. Now what I do is I take cannula assembly. So if you can look at the camera outside of the body, cannula assembly is actually two dilators in one. So what we're going to do is just take that right over dilator one, and I'm going to mallet, mallet, mallet. And I'll take a sh I got a shot here. Perfect. And what we're looking for is the outer cannula to advance uh, about 30% across the spinous process. Okay. Perfect. So probably hard to make out, but um, at least on my screen here that I can see, at least we're about 30% across the inferior spinous process, maybe about 20% for the superior spinous process. So I'm just going to advance a little bit further just to make sure that we're well in that inner spinous space. And the game we're playing here is you want to have enough purchase where that you're dilating the inner spinous space, you can, you can uh, ream, you can measure and put the superion in. If you're too far posterior, that dilator may, may fall out. So there's a give and take here. If you're too far advanced, you don't have enough room to work with. So that's why we say about 30%, but it changes from patient to patient or space to space. If a patient has really short spinous processes, you're going to be teetering on the edge of falling out, and that's okay. Sometimes you have to do that. If you have really long spinous processes, you can advance it pretty far, even to 50%, because you have plenty of room to work with. So that's great. So John, let's go back around. Let's do a down the barrel shot. Let's see how I did here. What you might have noticed is I did not um, do a lot of checks in between. So as you're starting out, really important to go back and forth to AP and lateral. Um, but I've done a few of these, and I've got some feel to it. So I think, you know, if anything, my 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 cannula might be a little bit off, but I feel like, hey, I'm, I'm in the right groove. And that's a feel thing. Again, use all the senses with this particular therapy because when you know you're in the inner spinous space, there is nice purchase. Everything sort of follows because of the design of the instruments. Perfect. So that's a great shot. So what you're seeing are those two little nubs straddling the spinous process. And then if you can go more caudal on the II, John. Beautiful. Yeah, I love it. Or maybe we can't because of the barriers. We'll just take a shot. And if not, no worries. I, I think we're, we're quite good. Hey, we're getting there. Yeah, we got a little bit more there. Perfect. And I can just tell you, even though we're not fully there, we're good. There's a little bit of rotation. Now, People often ask, well, it's a little rotated, you know, is that a problem? And the answer is really no. Think about this as a cylinder, even though we're seeing those nubs at the end, that's the natural path. If you look at those spinous processes from before we did any instrumentation, they had a little bit of angulation. So this is the natural path. So in general, if we didn't have this barrier to the pedestal here, we would have a more caudal on the II Ferguson view in order for us to see the nubs. But I can tell you, you know, I think you're getting a sense that we're almost there and we're, we're right on target. So we'll go back to lateral. Thank you. <clears throat> and then what I have here is the Game of Thrones weapon, as many of you have heard me call it. And this is yes. called the Reamer. And what the Reamer does is it clears out some of the soft tissue uh, behind <clears throat> the ligamentum flavum. Uh, I think I heard Doug talking about totalis, um, which is great to bring up some history. So in, in essence, what we're doing here is clearing out some of that tissue uh, behind, again, uh, the ligamentum flavum. So we'll show you this fluoroscopically. And again, the goal here is to take this to the spinal laminar line. Uh, a tendency I, I see people do is to really jam it in there. Don't jam a Game of Thrones weapon too aggressively, because that could be bad. There's only one thing you can do to screw up this procedure, and that is cross into the river sticks. Do not go into the dura, okay? So everything we're doing is behind the spinal laminar line, okay? I never want to hear about a case of any instrumentation or the device being anterior to this line. That should never, ever happen. This is a posterior procedure causing indirect decompression. Okay, and I'm just meeting some more resistance, and that's okay. So what I do is 
a door knob back and forth here just to clear out some more. Great. And sometimes when it's pretty tight here, you get a little close to bone. So I'm going to be satisfied with that. And I'm going to take my gauge, which allows me to measure that interspinous height. And what we do is we look for the bar to bend up. Great. So that's a 12. Let's go around and we'll look at the AP. So we'll get a... I can, I can load that for us. Perfect. Thank you, Tank. Thank you. So uh, as Doug already mentioned, we have uh, five different sizes, 8 through 16. The most common sizes are 10 and 12. Even though the most common size from the IDE study was actually a 14 millimeter, interestingly enough. Um, in that study, one of the criticisms is that there were a number of spinous process fractures on the order of 16%. So a number of surgeons will, will bring that up, say, hey, that, that's a huge fracture rate. I think we oversized. And so what we've done is optimize the way we do this procedure. And so our number one size now is 12 and 10. Um, again, you don't need to distract. This is not a kyphosis producing procedure. This is simply an extension blocker. So this is the 12, and then we'll take the driver and we drop this through. The driver is simply acting as the molly bolt. This driver has a bend. Do we have a new driver? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this, you know, all these instruments obviously have been used once or twice before. So this one is not going to fit through. Perfect. We'll work on that. Perfect. And let John, let's do the Ferguson views. So both cranial and caudal tilt on the II. Perfect. Yep. Not so far. Maybe a little less. Yeah. Just just go AP zero degrees on the cranial caudal tilt. Yeah. So the key. John's never done this vertiflex, so he's learning all this new, and he's doing an awesome job. So the key thing here for your Florotex is all you have to do is be 15 degrees more cranial with the II image intensifier, and then 15 degrees caudal to the instrument set. So if, you're, if we can look at the camera outside of the body, John's perfect here. Um, and you can see the two nubs of the gauge are now straddling that L3 spinous process. We'll try to do the same thing, caudal, if you can, John. I don't know if you have the clearance to get that true Ferguson view. Uh, if so, oh, let's, let's go this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah, and he's able to do it. So I can already see he's like, just like three to five degrees more caudal on the II, so we'll take a shot there. Uh, and it, you know, if you can't get any more, that's okay. But you can see that left little nub is just to the left of the spinous process. Uh, so we're almost there. There we go. We're, we're going to give John a bonus after this. <clears throat> Beautiful. So you can see the left nub. The right nub is, is kind of uh, hidden by the handle, uh, radio opacity, but that's all good. So that looks great. Uh, and so we can come back around to a lateral. And while we get our instrumentation uh, fixed, re-sterilized, <laughs> and remade up, we will uh, open it up to any questions so far. So Doug, are there any questions from the audience so far on what's been going on with the procedure, um, indications from the study, et cetera? So Rama, one question to kick it off. You mentioned uh, moderate stenosis. Yeah. So how would you um, identify patients with moderate stenosis? What, what is moderate stenosis? Great question. So a 25 to 50% reduction in area um, compared to the adjacent level is, is the NAS definition. Um, there are, there are, as Doug, you know, you're a radiologist, there are 11 different grading systems for determining the severity of stenosis uh, of the lumbar spine. One of the ways I use as a personal check uh, is to look at the CSF to nerve root or core density, uh, because if you see all of those nerve roots completely constricted um, and there's no CSF, that to me is severe stenosis. If you see a, basically a one-to-one -one ratio of CSF to nerve root, that's moderate. And if you see more CSF than nerve root, that is mild. Uh, that's, my, that's another check mechanism besides just measuring that cross-sectional area. Other ways include measuring diameters. And, and Doug, you can, you can elaborate on this even further. So the grading scales that we use primarily are, uh, does anybody know a grading scale? Does anybody use a particular grading scale? Not really. Because the reason why we don't know them is because they're not very useful. What uh, Dr. Naidu said about the 
nerve root and the CSF around the nerve roots is very important. The two grading scales most commonly used are called Shizus and Gwen. So Shizus grade C or a Gwen grade G means there's no more fluid around the nerve roots. And that's when inevitably people become symptomatic. The other thing that whenever it becomes severely symptomatic is uh, seven millimeters from top to bottom or a cross-sectional area less than 85 square millimeters. These are inevitably symptomatic. And whenever you get redundancy of the nerve roots and you see that on an MRI, you can tell not only that's been present, the patient is symptomatic, but they've been present for quite some time long enough to stretch the nerve roots out. And so these are uh, definitions that you can take home. I mean, these are important, applicable definitions of spinal stenosis. And I, I like that uh, Dr. Naidu's description about uh, presence of fluid around the nerves. If it's if it's one to one, it's moderate. If it's less, it's severe. If there's more fluid, then it's mild. Uh, that's something that you can this practical that fits into our existing definitions that you can kind of use. And whenever there's uh, redundancy of the uh, cauda equina, and whenever there's no fluid around the nerves, that patient will inevitably be symptomatic. So I want to open it up. Uh, very well done, Ramo, as usual. I um, <laughs> want to open it up to questions, comments. I had a question. Yes, so Ramo. do you ever have these fall out um, as you know, time progresses or the patient's spine ages? And if that does happen, then can you go back in and upsize it, or what's the alternative? So, Rama, I don't know if you heard that, but it's can, do these ever devices ever get displaced? And if they do get displaced, uh, what is the triage mechanism at that point in time? Can you upsize them? Can you replace them? Can you do uh, wh what is it that you do to, to uh, correct the dislodged Great. device? Great question. So, from the IDE study, there were no displacements or dislodgements. Even though the spinous process fracture rate, as I mentioned, was 16%, and by the way, that was radiological. Uh, so a number of patients were asymptomatic with spinous process fractures. There were, of course, some who were symptomatic and they had focal pain. I have never seen a dislodgement. Whenever I've seen x-rays of superions out of place, I always ask the, ask the providers to show me their final fluoro shot from their case. And if they can't show me that, that's a problem because it is nearly impossible that I can think of for this titanium H to somehow wiggle its way out of the inner spine of space and then be rotated or completely out. It had to have been implanted incorrectly, in my opinion. So if you have a final floor shot that actually shows good placement and then it somehow dislodges, uh, that's incredible, then we should write that up because I personally haven't seen that. Um, if it's coming out backwards, which I've never even heard of, um, then I'd be worried about closure technique or, or was there some seroma or something else that allowed it to come out backwards. The reason why these don't do that is because as they deploy, the cam lobes are now being held in place by all of the soft tissue ligaments and even the bone. So its ability to work out posteriorly is, is nearly impossible. So Doug, I don't know if you've seen any dislodgements or have any other things to add, but I just would say it's about operator technique if you see it. So I've got a couple of comments, Ramo, as you make your way back in for uh, the next discussion on uh, posterior elements, barriers to credentialing and coding reimbursement. Uh, so, Brian, what you were saying about dislodgement and displacement it does happen. I mean, this has uh, been kind of well described in the Welton paper, you know, and, it, and so anytime you have a fracture, a displacement, dislodgement leading to additional surgery, that happens at you know roughly a 20% rate. And so, as I mentioned previously, this is an extra step that provides good, durable, long-term, predictable outcomes. The, the disadvantage, and if, if you look back into meta-analysis, um, uh, Lee, Lee uh, Meyer, some of the other people that did big meta-analyses, they will say that this is um, as good as surgical decompression, but the disadvantage is, is that it requires uh, additional um, treatment m more often than a, a surgical decompression. The advantage primarily lies in the, uh, the operative parameters, less blood loss, less complications, shorter surgery, less morbidity. And so <clears throat> all of this is kind of a balance. And whenever you 
have a situation that these do dislodge, they can be removed and should be removed. There are removal tools available. You could go in and take them with the inserter that he just uh, showed. You could go in and grab this and, and take it out. And you, you could put the deployment device and instead of deploying it by righty tighty, you do lefty loosey, it collapses the cam lobes and pulls it out. Um, having said that, a lot of times you have to understand that these devices are made out of titanium and bone loves titanium. And, and uh, Jim Zuckerman wrote a great paper on not this, but the pre precursor to this called the X-Stop that said about a fourth of these will, will uh, be fused. They'll have uh, undergo auto fusion at the incident segment. So whenever you go in and try to take these out, just remember it's not, maybe not quite so simple. So you get a CT scan on them, and not uncommonly, you will see bridging bone. It's like a barbed wire growing into a tree. You will see these; the bone will grow, grow around these, and that is not necessarily a disadvantage in my mind. If you can do, if you can put these in uh, a non-fusion spacer that will actually fuse and, and provide a permanent benefit, that can be a permanent benefit. But if you have to take it out, remember that a lot of the times these will grow into the bone and they will be, be there. Uh, and it, this can be demonstrably uh, seen on CT scan. You know, I've got, got one patient we affectionately refer to as uh, two tickets, and it, he has some of the, uh, his, his, uh, his last name is Paradise. So he has great bridging bone across. I mean, and this is as good as, as any uh, f purposeful fusion that you can see. You know, this, these titanium alloys, what are they? TI6AL4V, titanium, aluminum, and vanadium. These are common titanium medical grade, and bone loves titanium. So this, this will can and will fuse and grow across. Questions, comments? Well, I'll ask one. Yes, uh, Neil. Uh, for exclusion criteria, since uh, spinal stenosis uh, is frequently associated with uh, spondylolisthesis, uh, for exclusion criteria, what um, uh, what level of spondylolisthesis triggers in your mind that uh, this is not a good environment for an interspinous device? And really good question, right? So this, the book answer is grade one. The real answer is grade 0.5. And this is, for those of you not familiar, this is the Meyerding classification, 25, 50, 75, 100%, grade one through four, respectively. And 0.5, no more than 0.5. Because if you do, the, uh, the cylindrical barrel of this is flat on the top and the bottom. And that's one of the greatest things. It distributes the von Mises forces across. And so it has to be any type of interspinous process device. If it has a north pole and a south pole, is the wrong device. It's got to be flat on the top and bottom. And so if, if it's not, then it, it won't work. And if this, the, the vertiflex superior on Boston Scientific device, if it can'ts a little bit, because of spinal esthesis, it, it can tilt and become sharp on the edges. So pragmatically, although it's uh, the IFU says grade one, it's not. It's it's 0.5. So for those in the audience, the inference is uh, as instability increases, uh, you want to shy away uh, from the procedure and use it as an exclusion criteria because you're putting the device in a very challenging biomechanical environment. Yeah, as instability increases, the need for fusion increases. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Naidu for his discussion. Okay, he's gonna finish the procedure, so great. We, fa we found... <laughs> A deployment, a, d a driver to deploy. All right, Ramo, back over to you. All right, can you guys hear me? I've been trying to get your attention for 10 minutes, but they they, they blocked me out. So um, let me just finish the procedure. We did get our instruments back, thank you. Um, and I'll even talk while I deploy here. So we're behind the spinal laminar line uh, with the superior, as you can see uh, on the uh, 
fluoroscope imaging here. And so I'm going to slowly, I'm going to use three fingers. I'm not going to use a lot of force here to deploy. So I'm just very slowly deploying here and until I meet some resistance. And that's the point where you need to check fluoro. A lot of people like to check fluoro so often. My fluoro times are less than 30 seconds for the, these kind of cases. So only check when you have to. And so you can see here it's deploying very smoothly and easily. And then as you meet more resistance, you just check. It's still going. We're behind the lamina, as you can see here. So if you look at that spinal laminar line, it's deploying behind it. Continue to open and then check. And once you get to about 90 degrees in opening, that's when you want to check an AP here. So I'm doing what's called the sagittal arc, which is a force forward towards the head, force towards the foot, back to the middle, and then deploy. And if you just notice, it was much easier. So that tells us we're in soft tissue. Let's go AP here, John. The key, question, the key point on the spondylolisthesis bit, to Dr. Schonard's point, is we have to measure the translation. Yes, Doug is right, you know, less than one grade one spondylolisthesis, you know, we know that the outcomes are not as good at 24% than they are at 3%, right? So we need to change the grading system. I think percentile will be better for us going forward in this interventional spine world. So we know that, you know, if it's a 5% spondy versus a 25% spondy, we're probably gonna have a better outcome. But the most important thing is translation. We know this device will not work if there's three millimeters or more of translation. It just will not. It won't sit in the space right. There's a greater chance of dislodgement as has already been mentioned. So do not consider it in patients with that kind of translation. So you have to be checking a flexion extension x-ray uh, and doing it the right way. So you can see here on the fluoro, um, our cam lobes are, are the, there's a field goal. Great, we just got three points, that looks great. And we'll check the bottom, John, so if you can just do that Ferguson view, perfect. So we'll check the bottom as well. Always important to check both. Don't just you know, sit on your laurels and say, oh yeah, we got one, that looks great. The bottom may be completely in a different location. So you can see, you know, it's, it's good, we're straddling, but it's a little bit closer, uh, that right cam lobe to the spinous process. So while, since I know I'm behind the lamina at this point, I can actually stay in AP, right? So we're in lateral to make sure we're not hitting the lamina or anterior to lamina. We're behind that, we've confirmed that, we're at 90 degrees. So now I can just play with the device using the sagittal arc. And what I'm doing is I've, I'm leaning in the handle towards me, okay? As I continue to deploy and I do the sagittal arc. And you'll see here, it's deploying, but I'm also correcting the straddling. So now we'll check the top. So I'm making these little, these adjustments. So John, do you mind going cranial tilt on the II? I want my cam lobes to be perfectly straddled in the spinous process. Why? Even though if it's, if it's just doing it in general, and it's off to one side, it's going to do the job. The comfort of the patient is much greater if you're off the bone. If you have titanium rubbing on bone, that's uncomfortable. And it may lead to the issues that, that Doug was explaining, which could be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Um, so this is great. So I'm, I'm straddling both the top and bottom. So I'm just going to keep that sagittal arc back to the middle. And I'm going to take this all the way until it stops. And once you get to about 120 degrees of opening, it basically will go all the way to 180 without any issue. So there it's stopped. So we can go to a lateral. Perfect. And I take out the driver, which is just the blue handle here. And then I'm going to mallet this straight down. And John's going to give me a, a shot here when he can. Perfect. And I'm taking this again to the spinal laminar line. You guys guessed it. Perfect. And we don't want to, we don't want to bang too hard. So basically, you, there's an audible thud where you're on the lamina. Uh, and it didn't really move. So now I lift up the lever in the front, side to side shake, take everything out, shot there. Save that shot, John. Beautiful. Go to AP. And, and you guys, you have to save these shots. If, you, if there's any issue, like you mentioned, dislodgement, if you don't have these shots in a court of law to say, I place this appropriately behind the spinal laminar line, my camel to Australian spinous process, you really have nothing to stand on. So you really need to save these shots. Field goal, three points, wonderful. That's how you do a superion. I'll come over and do the reimbursement talk. Thanks, Doug. You bet. Now, that's a, a great final view. Can we, can we see the final view of the, uh, the AP shot one more time? Yeah. So my, uh, my texts think that looks like plankton from SpongeBob. And uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I put a little cartoon plankton with my last um, Vertiflex superion. It does resemble that. 
Um, so as, as Ron was coming over, so moderate stenosis, uh, good long-term data. This is something that is especially useful. And he said one and a half um, centimeters. This really, uh, that's plenty of an incision. Really about a, uh, 10 millimeters is about all you need to get one of these in. Okay, I got a question. Yeah, so, Brian, go um, ahead. If the patient has thumb listhesis, I know there are other options to help with stenosis and listhesis. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't use this device because it doesn't really support um, securing that listhesis. So what would you suggest in that kind of situation? So in a patient with uh, spinal listhesis and stenosis, something that is this beyond the uh, 0 0.5 uh, Meyerdin classification for spinal listhesis, uh, there are fusion spacers available. So that whenever we want to graduate to the point where we stabilize plus fuse, it takes about three to six months for fusion to happen. Uh, there's data on this. I mean, there's uh, unpublished data uh, that I just reviewed and, and wrote. But to use published data, the formica data is probably the best. It's about a 93% fusion rate. So it's it's actually pretty good. For, so for people that hear the interspinous fusion spacers don't fuse, I mean, that's that's just all apocryphal. That's, that's inaccurate. They do fuse, and they fuse at a really high rate, and they fuse faster, three to six months. And this is fusion at six months. is uh, was about 93%. And this is a you know, good good number to keep in your pocket. So any type of instability beyond about a 0.5 degree of instability, and this is all relative. I mean, this we have to do flex extension. I don't want to get in, digress into what is stable and what is unstable, but if you feel like you need a little bit of instability applied to your stenosis treatment, that's when you reach for a fusion spacer. And that fusion spacers, there's quite a few of them. There's Stable Ink, uh, Southern Spine, there's uh, Roar Zip, uh, Minutemen by Spinal Simplicity. Uh, those are probably the most commonly used. Nice question. Yes. Does it have to be a single level problem or it can be used in a multi-level setting? So these are one or two levels. And thanks for asking that. That something uh, we should have pointed out previously. This is one or two levels. And the reason why it's one or two levels is because that's what it's approved for, for all of the spacers that I mentioned, it's approved for one or two levels because if you take the lumbar lordotic angle, that's typically a lumbar lordosis is about 50 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees. That's a normal lumbar lordosis angle. Peter Wang wrote the, the original study that said if you put one or two spacers in, if you pin these in extens effectively using an extension blocker, it doesn't change the lumbar lordotic angle overall. So you can measure the, the global. You measure from you know the top of um, L1 to the top of S1. That doesn't change even if you have two uh, extension blocking devices, interspinous posterior devices. So the global uh, overall alignment doesn't change. Can you can you use these at L5 S1? Another good question. So if you're putting one at L5 S1, back away from the table and ask yourself, is this the right level? The answer is yes. You do put them at L5 S1. Transistal lumbosacral anatomy is present about 15% of the general population. Uh, that, that's, what, that's what the data says. I asked this question to chat GPT. Uh, um, and so anybody care to guess what chat GPT says? 30%. So maybe it's closer to 30 Maybe AI is, is, is looming. They're, maybe they're correct. Maybe they're smarter than we are, Neil. I don't know. But it's, it, so you can have transistor lumbosacral anatomy and have it lumberized. Maybe it's more like a 4.5 than a 5.1. But typically, the S1 spinous process is vestigial. So yes, you can put them at 5.1. It's rare. I've done like a handful in my career, maybe five or six. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of these. So just make sure you're at the right level. But yeah, you can have a 5-1. And then last question on this. So do you typically start off at the lower levels, say like 4-5, and then perhaps, you know, if they're still not stable, come back six months or a year later and go up to the higher level? Yeah, I do. Or do them both two levels at the same time? So if, 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 it, if it looks like there's affected, two levels are affected, I do them both. And there are occasions where we will put in more than two. I, I understand what I just told you, the rationale. You know, I live in the real world as well, and if the 87-year-old guy with two-level stenosis presents with the third level, I'm going to do the third level. So 
the, yeah, I do one or two levels. The, the the most affected levels first. If there's two, I do two, et cetera. So, you know, I, I don't have any hesitation to just go ahead and do two levels straight off the top. Yes. I know there's literature on adjunctive spinoplasty. Not sure what's your opinion of that. Best literature on that um, topic is from a guy named Luigi Manfrey um, out of Sicily. He took 688 patients, 256 patients uh, with spinous process augmentation, the rest without. The, uh, and I love what he did about measuring this. Symptom recurrence, yes or no? The symptom recurrence without spinous process augmentation was 11.1%. The symptom recurrence with spinous process augmentation was less than one percent. So, I spinous process augment every single time. Um, I don't criticize those who don't. It's dealer's choice, but I believe that data, and I'm, uh, and this is only for non-fusion spacers. If you if you want fusion, my advice to you is don't spinous process augment <clears throat> because the osteocytes are a lot less likely to grow across, and that 93% fusion rate will very likely go down, although it hasn't been measured. Uh, my worthless uh, opinion is, is that it, it, the fusion rates are not nearly as well if you do that. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Naidu.